Chapter 5 The Thunder Slice As the team made their way to Echinim's shrine on the outskirts of the city, anticipation hung thick in the air. Night Eagle flew ahead while Tahazi rode below with light speed jogging effortlessly at his side. Soon the shrine's gleaming marble walls came into view. But as they drew nearer, the heroes spotted signs of battle. The ancient shrine lay in ruins, rubble and scorch marks, evidence of vicious magical battle. Life's speed came to an abrupt stop, eyes wide. We're too late. The demigods are already here. Exchanging an urgent look, the heroes rushed through the towering gates, preparing for the confrontation ahead. Upon entering the compound of the shrine, they find Kweku near the protruding hilt of the thunder slice. Obempe and Yempel turn to face the new arrivals, clearly intending to delay them from reaching the boy. You get the kid, Night Eagle shouted to light speed. What should I say? She asks. Figure it out, Night Eagle responds. Lightspeed nodded and dashed towards Kweku in a blur, leaving Night Eagle and Tohazi to meet the approaching demigods. One of them was strong enough when she was a human. What can we do against two of them as spirits? Night Eagle asked as she drew her retractable blades from her belt. I have some tricks up my own sleeve, Tohazi said as he pulled out his small carved gourd from behind him. He dips his hand into the mouth of the gourd, and it magically fits, despite the gourd having a small mouth. When Tahazi draws out his hand, he holds up a glowing golden sword. Night Eagle looked at Tahazi in surprise. Is everything about you in the history books true? Tahazi seemed to consider this as a compliment and smiled back at Night Eagle. He then slowly walks towards the two demigods, who are surprised to see Tohazi's sword as well. Tohazi? Obempe asked in surprise. Yempel didn't understand why Obempe mentioned that name. It can't be, Yempel added as he observed the bald man with black beard holding a glowing golden sword. He remembered the golden sword. That's the Star Cutlass. It is you. Yempel was surprised. What happened to your hair? Obempe exclaimed with fake laughter. It's good you remember me, Obempe. Tazi replied as he approached the demigods. There is no way this can end well for either of you. Return to your fortress beyond Afajato or, or wherever in the spirit domain and I'll allow it. But stay and this will end the same as last time. Shut up! Obempe shouted as she angrily shot gale magic towards Tahazi, which he absorbed into his glowing blade. He then swipes his sword at them, sending back the blast. Meanwhile, life speed stops several feet away from Kweku. She sees his hands on the rocks surrounding the thunder slice. Up close, his youth was even more apparent, no more than twelve. His eyes practically glowed with raw power. That made Lightspeed tremble inside as he lifted his eyes to look at her. His face was marked with scars that will never heal. Who would do such a thing to a boy his age? As she watched, he wrapped his young hands around the hilt of the sword, almost reactively. Each scar on his face started to glow with ethereal light. How would she reach him? What could she do? She quickly takes off her mask. Hey there, she said gently. I'm Janice. What's your name? The boy looks startled. My name is Kweku. Why did you take off your mask? To show you that this is just me. No mask or tricks. She gave him a disarming smile. Kweku absentmindedly glanced between the sword and Janice. Kweku, you don't have to do this, Lightspeed urged. Kweku's brow furrowed. But they said it's my destiny. Don't listen to them. Destiny isn't something that gets handed to you. She took a deep breath before continuing. My dad died when I was 12. That seemed to get Kweku's attention. 
His tribal marks stopped glowing so intently. My mom became obsessed with molding me into the perfect daughter after my dad died, Jonas explained. She wanted me to become a track star, even though I hated running. No matter how hard I trained, I could never meet her impossible standards. She shook her head bitterly at the memory. When I turned 16, she actually paid some scientists to secretly experiment on me and modify my genes to make me run faster. The experiments went horrible, and I lost both of my legs. And when I could no longer participate in races, my mom dumped me at a care home for years and moved abroad. Janice moved her mask uncomfortably with the hard memories. My point is, don't let anyone tell you your destiny. They only say that when they want to use you. You get to choose your own path. Kwaku looked thoughtfully at Lightspeed. Meanwhile, Tahazi found his hands full, fending off Obembe's unrelenting gale force winds. Nearby, Yempel keeps Night Eagle on the defensive with more blasts of Hamaton shards. Night Eagle does her best to hold her own, but Yempel is merciless in his attacks. When he's able to knock Night Eagle down with a blast of sand, it finally dawns on him that she is only human. This knowledge excited him. You have no business fighting here amongst demigods and powerful beings, Yempo said as he catches an explosive bomb that Night Eagle threw at him. It explodes in his hand and he coughs while waving away the smoke. <coughs> you could easily be swept aside by any one of the people here, Yempo sent a shard of on Night Eagle and she dodges but felt the cold grip her. One wrong move by your friends, or one unlucky shot from any of us, and you'll be dead. He shoots another blast at her when she barely dodges. And yet you choose to fight here among gods. I respect that, he says. I'll try to remember you. As Night Eagle hid behind another wall, she felt Yen Pel's words get to her. He was right. What was she doing here? Tahazi realized Yempel was close to hurting Night Eagle and quickly intervened with an energy strike from his star powers. Yempel dodges the blast and regroups with his sister as Tahazi moves to Night Eagle's side. We can't keep this up, Night Eagle shouted as another roar of wind came shooting at him. Tahazi absorbs it into the cutlass and swings it back towards the demigods to force them back. Meanwhile, Back at the Thunder Slice. After a thoughtful pause, Kwaku finds himself agreeing with life speed. People only ever call on him when they need something dirty or heavy to be done. All he was doing was standing on the sidelines of a football game when these two came to trick him. No one really cared about him. Kwaku felt bitter about it. Life speed takes a slow step forward and then wraps her hands gently around Kwaku's. Obempe sees life speed and Kwaku from a distance and is not happy with what she sees. Without second thought, she hurled a large shard of Hamaton energy at Kwaku. Kwaku's impregnable skin resists getting stabbed, but the force of the push sends him and life speed hurling into rock. For a moment, Lightspeed finds both her and Kwaku's hands gripping the hilt of the unsheathed thunder slice as it pulsates with raw energy. They both look at each other in surprise and immediately drop the sword. A tremendous thunder shook the shrine's foundation. Dark clouds covered the area. The demigods paused their attack, faces paling. Lightning and gusts of wind flowed everywhere. The lightning itself formed the shape of an armored, muscular figure in the skies. Who dares? boomed Ajinim, eyes ablaze from his lightning form in the skies. That's Ajinim, the firstborn of their pantheon, Tazi muttered. He was already etching glowing sigils into the ground, preparing a binding ritual. That's just his spectral form. He is harmless, so far as he doesn't take human size like Obempe and Yempel. Lightspeed said in panic, we can't fight a giant like that. Where do we start? What do we do? Ajinin towered over them, lightning crackling. His gaze fixed on the thunder slice on the ground near Quaker. As they watched, his towering, godly form shrunk in 
into human size. Although still taller than the average man, he appeared plump with big cheeks and a protruding round pot belly. His voice resonated with raw power. You will pay for this. He thrust out a hand and living lightning arc towards him. Taken's tribal marks glowed a furious red as he met the furious demigod's gaze. The boy dwarfed in comparison, but the bolt fizzled from his skin. With a roar, Ajinim opened his palms and called back the thunder slice into his hand. The sword flies into his grip. He moves his sword to cut through Kweku, and the boy jumps out of the way as quickly as he possibly can, fear starting to show on his face. Ajinim pointed the thunder slice skyward, thunder rolled, the clouds twisted and lightning poured around him with the rain. The demigod swept his arms down, unleashing a protrusive blast at Kiku, which knocked him down and electrocuted him. The boy screams in agony. Sensing opportunity, Obenpeng Yenpel rushed forward, conjuring winds to obscure Ajinim's vision, but he was fixated on harming the boy before Ajinim could notice. Obenpeng Yenpel plunged conjured sand and wind blades into his back. Ajinim cried out in rage and pain. Obenpeng Yenpel continued to conjure and stab Hamatan blades into Ajinim until he sank to his knees and dropped the thunder slice. Obenpe quickly picks it up, lifts it, and stabs Ajinim in the back. I should have known, he croaked. The earth stilled as Ajinim fell into the dirt. The stormy sky returned to a sickly calm, but the air still crawled with relentless energy. Obempe and her brother both held up the thunder slap triumphantly. Crackles and bursts of lightning form around them both like rain, and when everything calmed, they had both vanished. Tazi's face paled with dread. No! He slammed his fist into rubble as the demigods disappeared with their prize. They had failed again, and now two vengeful gods possessed the ultimate weapon. Ajinim's fallen body suddenly erupted immediately into a chaos storm. The earth shook violently, lightning and rumbles thunder in the skies, and a great tornado formed up, consuming everything. The shrine shook, and the heroes scrambled to find safety in the midst of the chaos. Lightspeed quickly grabs Night Eagle and takes her to safety. She returned quickly, trying to reach Kweku. Before she'll reach him, however, a blast of lightning from the Chaos Storm connects with her. She cried out as a deadly energy coursed through her body, then collapsed, twitching. The Chaos Storm quickly passes, leaving the shrine torn down to rubble. Lightspeed had rescued Night Eagle but was caught under the rubble with Kweku and Tohazi. Lightspeed, come in! Night Eagle called into her communicator. She's very terrified for her protege. This is what she feared the most when she brought Janice into this life. Lightspeed! Janice! She pulled off stone and wood trying to find Lightspeed. Please, come in! She finds Kweku first, his tribal marks glowing furiously. His back was up and his arms planted firmly into the ground. When Kweku rolls over, Lightspeed is curled up with eyes squeezed shut and covered in dust underneath him. She opens her eyes slowly and sees Night Eagle and Kweku looking down at her. All was not well, but she was not in any pain. One of her legs was trapped under a large fallen wall and it showed exposed wires and metallic bone. How are you feeling? Night Eagle asks her. Lightspeed nods to confirm she is fine. But deep down, this only reminded her of the days that the doctor ran tests on her leg and spine. This reminded her of the shock she felt when she woke up one day without legs. Night Eagle moves to stand behind Lightspeed. With some effort, Night Eagle helps Light to wrench her shin from under the fallen wall, severing it from the rest of her robotic leg. A short distance away, a hand breaks out of the rubble, and someone tries to climb out. Kweku quickly goes to offer a hand. Tahazi climbs out of the rubble 
and the others find him broken and bleeding in multiple places. Any normal person might need to be in the emergency room or might probably had already died, but not Tohazi. As they watched, his body started to repair itself, bones snapping back to place, dirt falling out of his open wounds and his skin resealing itself till he was back to normal. The others are very surprised at what they just witnessed, but Tahazi turned their attention to something else. The chaos storm had not yet ended. It had only passed them and was now headed towards the city. Tazi explained, that storm is Ajanim without a mind or vessel. That will just continue until he finds a vessel to contain him. Night Eagle stares back at Tahazi, mind racing. How was she supposed to deal with a chaos storm? Was Yempel right? Did she have no business here? She felt very out of place and out of options. We need to trap all of that power inside a powerful tree or a human vessel, Tazi continued. I will do it. Quaku interjected. What? Lightspeed asked. I can do it. I'm very strong, Quaku replies. I know you're strong, boy. Tahazi replied, and I wouldn't consider this if I wasn't sure you could somehow handle this. But why? I started this, Kweku said. All of this happened because of me. Let me help. That sounds really dangerous, Night Eagle asks. She doesn't like the idea very much. Realization then hits Tahazi. You've done this before. The boy dropped his head in sadness. That is why you have those marks, Tahazi added. Night Eagle asked, Who did that to you? My grandfather, Kweku replied. Tazi raises Kweku's head by his, the chin and looks down at the scars on the boy's face, considering. I can do it. Kweku hoped that this will make up for what he did. Hmm. Tazi mumbles in disapproval, but seems to agree to Kweku's request. At Tazi's request, Night Eagle and Lightspeed retreat a short distance away from where Tahazi and Kweku stood alone. Stomping his feet on the ground, Tahazi begins an incantation. The atmosphere responds with a small gush of wind spinning around Kweku and Tahazi. At first, the chaos storm stops moving towards the populated city. The storm then turns around and starts to approach Tahazi and Kweku very quickly. Once close enough, Kweku readied himself, his tribal marks glowing brightly. The chaos storm funnels itself into a ray of white light that Kweku swallows into silence. Kweku's tribal marks continued to glow violently. He gasped, clutching his stomach violently, convulsions racking his small frame. It was as if he'd swallowed a hurricane. Gale force winds and lightning whirring inside him for dominance. Though eyes squeezed shut against the pain, he saw the lightning form faces that contorted in silent screams. They clawed at Kweku's mind, howling for release. Kweku turned inward. He envisioned his grandfather's compound, the last place that felt like home. He sees his grandfather holding the knife that he used to mark his face. He then envisions his grandfather's shrine, where his grandfather had imprisoned several malicious spirits, including one particularly powerful force. He envisions the spirit taking the shape of an elephant that bows to Kweku. Kweku bows back to the elephant. He then envisions himself releasing the spirit of the elephant from the shrine. The elephant spirit gives him a second tribal mark. He then envisions the elephant spirit becoming a giant and trampling his entire village underfoot. So many people cradled their deceased loved ones. Kweku looks on in horror. He then envisions his grandfather seeing the second mark on Kweku's face from the elephant spirit. His grandfather is angry. He then envisions his grandfather carving several more tribal marks in his face casting of powerful incantations to trap the spirit of the elephant inside Kweku. The last image Kweku sees is the spirit of the elephant trapped inside a dark space, surrounded by sparks of lightning and electricity. 
Looking outward again, Kweku's eyes flash white and his body gets covered in angry sparks of electricity that eventually die down until he becomes a normal boy with normal tribal marks. When Kweku rose to his feet again, Tahazi observed him closely to make sure he was still the same boy in control. I hate that I had to do this to you, boy. I'll make sure to help you remove these spirits. Lightspeed limped back with Night Eagle, and she didn't waste time celebrating Kweku. Woohoo! You actually saved the city today, Kweku, she said. She's right, Night Eagle added. Thank you for doing this. Kweku felt more guilt than pride. Had it not been for him, things wouldn't have gotten this bad. How many people have died or lost from this incident alone? So now, Obempe and Yempo, Night Eagle said grimly, surveying the devastation around Ajinim's shrine. Tazi held up a hand. It wasn't easy stopping them the first time they had the thunder slice. And back then, I had help from four of the strongest demigods. Aren't there any of these demigods who can help us? Lightspeed asked impatiently. Come on, there's got to be someone. Tazi stroked his beard thoughtfully before responding. There may be one way. The demigod's fortress in the spirit realm beyond Afajatu. Lightspeed interjected. You mean all the way to the Volta region? Yes, Tazi replies. And we'll need a bosom coin key. Bosom what now? Lightspeed interrupted again. A bosom coin, Tazi explained. A spirit key that opens access to various spirit domains. Night Eagle crossed her arms. Do you have a bosom coin? Tazi smiled slightly. As fate would have it, I do. I'll find it and meet you at your nest. As Tohazi walked away with Night Eagle and light speed, Kweku stayed behind indecisively. The three stopped and turned around to Kweku. Are you coming, boy? Tazi asks. Kweku brightens up and follows. 